that they're talking about in America? Who's paying for that? The taxpayers have to pay for that. They can't pay for that. They are not making enough money to pay for that. So they are now in bondage to this to this arrangement between private bankers and central bankers, all nice little colonies together, so that we need to bring back and have righteousness. But that is the core of our problem. So we need to just take back and take that control. And it's only by people power. There's 22 million of us. There's only those people in Canberra against us. Like, it's really, you know, it might sound, they're the ones that are actually past the policies. They're the ones that sell their soul. They are sold out. But it's really them that we need to keep that pressure on. And if we do nothing, we will have nothing. Just before we take questions, and please come up to the front, just want to check the temperature for you. Is there anybody here that's too cold? Put your hands up. Okay. Anybody here that's too hot? Put your hands up. All right. Who's just right? Okay. It looks like we're just right. Your question, please, to Debbie. I've been interested in the setup of the Australian Reserve Bank. I'm suspicious as a it's run like a private bank, but I can't find uh, any data about it being a private bank. There's actually, there's actually quite a lot on YouTube. There's some terrific stuff on the internet. And there's good stuff on YouTube. There's good stuff. If you put it in a Google search, you'll actually find all sorts of things that come up to show you that it is actually private banking. I should, I should search for the Australian Reserve Bank. Ownership, ownership, ownership of the bank. And you will find there'll be the mainstream staff that'll be telling you, oh yeah, we're just the government department, yeah. And it even has the website, federalreserve.gov.au, hey, yeah, that's good, so all oh, that must make it government. But it's not, it's all smoke and mirrors to delude you to believe that it is part of the government. It's not. Don't they all have ACN numbers? Someone owns them? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And I actually, again, I haven't researched this enough, so forgive me, um, but I actually believe our tax department is also private, but that's just... The IMF owns all the tax offices yeah. councils. Yeah, and everything. My question is... <laughs> my question is, do we need governments and do we need banks? Look at Samuel, verse 8. Uh, sorry, chapter 8, verse 3 to the we end don't. of the chapter. We right. don't. And can we not hold a gun to the head of our government ministers and banks too? Hey, can I? I'll be there with you. I tell you, I am really angry. I am really, really angry because this is so corrupt. You just don't, you actually have to really start thinking deeper about this. Like, I've known for a long time that it's created credit and yada yada. But it's not until you understand the flow of money. And then what happens with that flow of money? And it's all being used to destroy you. Then you see, whoa, this is really big. That this is the core. Every one of the issues that you're talking about here stems from the fact that the money is coming from central bankers who buy people. People are selling their souls all over the place. That's not a problem. How much, you know? I just got the printing press, gave a million dollars to get it passed. I read in Tony Pitt's paper that Malcolm Turnbull was promised $60 million to bring in the Republic back when it was a, when, when the referendum. So he was really, really cranky when it didn't actually happen. So guess who's now been staged up and coming up through the ranks? Not only is nice Malcolm Turnbull um, after the Republic, he is a banker. Whoa. Your question, please. Yeah, thank you for that excellent address. Your passion shows. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Um, a, a comment and a question, if I may. Um, in these... I read in the 700 billion bailout deal the fraction of the fractional reserve. There is a clause, a zero clause in there. In, in that, in, hidden in that deal is um, not 10 percent. There is a, a, a oh deal. yeah, yeah. I think that they see. I think that they're burdening the nations. See that, that to me, 
Again, this is my private opinion. I believe the Brigalow Corporation is there for when we default on our national debt. They're raising the debt to the point where you have to default. You're not going to pay it. You're already stretched beyond where you can go. So therefore, we'll raise up the debt. Now we come to this lovely little arrangement, a debt for equity swap. We'll take your, your country, and if you're really good, we might feed you. And, and the question, a stalwart at the NREL forum some years ago said that if you push this thing too hard, constitutionally or any other way, there's a good chance you'll finish up dead. I agree. Yeah. And I, I, I know my phone has been tapped for a long time. Your question, please, and I hope we see you again. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Fear is Satan, not a god. I'm sorry, uh, the last thing you just preempted me, but uh, presidents have died fighting this. Absolutely. That is the absolute truth. This is how powerful they are. But there's more of us than them. We have to remember that. Guns. Yeah. <laughs> and Hitler outlawed guns too. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, your question. It, essentially, this uh, brought up uh, just a question now. What for the average person like you? Uh, and gold and guns, silver. Get what yourself. What can we do? Because if we have a mortgage, if we have some loans, yes, we can pay them off if we can. But what? For but if you caught, who cannot. Okay, if you're caught, well, um, what I have done, I have invested, I have been fortunate to just sell um, and get rid of my debt. Um, but I've also put that money into silver. Now, the company that I have used to buy my silver with, um, the fellow that started that, he started investing in gold on behalf, it was in Adelaide, and he started collecting gold on behalf of other people and depositing that with the Perth Mint. And then he went to the Perth Mint and he asked for an audit on his gold. And the Perth Mint said, uh-uh, not going to give it to you. So then he went to all the banks around the world and he couldn't find one bank who would give him an audit on his gold or silver holdings. So, um, but that particular person started his own. He said if every Christian, this was quite some time ago, so I'm assuming it still applies now, if every Christian on the face of the earth owned one ounce of gold and five ounces of silver, we would control world finance. How's that? So my money is in silver. So that's what I think you need to do. And even if you have debt, and as a matter of fact, I've been reading on the internet that the bankers, in their haste to... Get, uh, provide mortgages for people have not tied the mortgage to the title and therefore people are living in their house the, the, so the bank can't foreclose on them because there's no proof that that debt actually belongs to that property right? so there, there's a stalemate people are staying in their houses and not paying the mortgage so I was about because I was very close to defaulting I was looking at simply Take out my equity, I'll refinance, pull out my equity, and now default. What are you going to do? So, that, uh, uh, if I was going to default, I was going to go down and see how far I could go down that path. <coughs> now, I believe there's a little bit of, of rustlings happening on that, that level. So, again, that's just something that maybe in the future we could look at as being, you know, if we all simply said, I'm not paying the mortgage, not paying tax, what do you think they're going to do? So could then, for instance, yes. Kevin Rudd, uh, yeah, Kevin Rudd do the same as Abraham Lincoln and, and Ken, President Kennedy to actually put an executive order, so to speak, out to actually print our own money and say, reserve banks, you can go home, yeah, and you, we don't want to do that. Sure, but, but you're not going to get that the from thing. your current politicians because they've already sold their soul, right? You need honest, integrous people to do that who are caring about the people. Well, thank you very much indeed, Debbie. Most enlightening. <laughs> Why should we when they don't even trust us with their pens? <laughs> <laughs> now, Brian McDermott is going to give us a short, turk, short talk for five minutes on the monetary system. Let's welcome Brian McDermott. First of all, I'd like to uh, 
thank uh, Debbie for a, a very interesting talk uh, with one very, very important caution. Be very, very careful about getting talked into going back onto the gold standard. I say that because who do you think owns the goal? That's the first thing. The second thing is, that's the very th very trap. You'll be walking out of one trap straight into another one. And it won't make a bit of difference to the debt-based monetary system. It's very important that you get your mind around that. I've been studying this monetary system for 50 years and my dad 50 years before that. <laughs> And he was a very, very informed person. I won't go into it now except to inform you <coughs> that there is a, uh, a People's Action Forum on November, you might like to make a note of this, on November 1st and 2nd, that's in what, three weeks time or so, three or four weeks time, at Marucci Door. If you haven't got a card or you're not on my internet emailing, um, see me, uh, as soon as you can I'll give you a card send me an email and I'll put you on the list, okay? Much, uh, there's a number of subjects being discussed there over two days by very informed people, and that includes the banking and the debt-based monetary system and the way to correct it. Some of you, some of you older people, may have heard of a chap named C.H. Douglas, yeah. and that uh, came out, who, who, who created, if you like, invented or devised or calculated out as a monetary system known as social credit. Some of you have heard about that? Okay. That's uh, not a debt-based monetary system. It is a credit-based monetary system. And Deb, with your experience, I'd dearly like you to study that because you're obviously a very talented and a very informed lady. And if I can help you in any way, shape, or we're obviously on the same side of the ledger. And if I can help you... <laughs> excuse the pun, <laughs> but if I can help you there in any way, shape or form, I'd dearly like to form an alliance with you and a working relationship with you because you're very, very close to being on the right track. In fact, you, as so far as the problems are concerned, you're dead set on the right track. It's just a question of the solutions. Some of our politicians are fairly, fairly close to being on the right track very few of us have the politicians, but one or two on the problems, but hopeless on solutions. Um, <clears throat> the Just um, somebody mentioned about the Briglow Corporation. I'm not an expert on the Briglow Corporation, but just to bring you up to date, and I think Ray mentioned it or someone brought it up, um, I only got word from uh, uh, the girl in, Sue. not Melanie, Sue Nines, um, uh, who will be speaking at our uh, forum on the Sunshine Coast, by the way, that the latest word back from the High Court, which was only this week, I believe, what's the day, said that? Yeah, this week, I believe, only two or three days ago, back came word from the High Court saying, this is, I think the, uh, correct me if I haven't got the words exactly right, but it's outside the jurisdiction of the High Court. <laughs> Can you believe that? the High Court of Australia and it's outside the jurisdiction of the High Court? I don't, I don't believe I'm hearing this. The High Court of Australia. And there's no... High, we don't have a, a Privy Council anymore, you know that, don't you? We don't have any higher way to go to appeal. Won't be a second, no, Marco. Uh, there are, there's a few things, just a couple of things, and uh, I think I've run out of time here. Uh, <clears throat> but very closely, no, avoid the... the a money system should be based on a, on a country's productive capacity. Nothing to do with gold. And I'll tell you something else that not many people know. But who do you think sets the price of gold? The House of Rothschild. And they set it twice per day in London. So, now, do you want to go on the gold standard? No, thank you. The other thing to keep in mind is, imagine a country that has no gold. They've got plenty of steel, plenty of uranium, plenty of this, plenty of that, plenty of copper, plenty of everything, but let's assume they've got no gold. They've got plenty of agricultural land, plenty of water, plenty of skills, plenty of common sense. They can grow, they've got plenty of timber, plenty of bricks, everything, but not, not got no gold. Does that mean they've got to sit and starve? 
doesn't make sense, does it? Think about it. I think I've nearly run out. Um, what you'll also learn about uh, in the forum uh, in three weeks' time is that some of us seceded four years ago and set, established the Central Queensland Free State of Australia. We we thought that and believe we still believe that it's virtually under normal circumstances too far gone, and they've chucked me in the chair as governor and. We're in the process of developing, the software's already written, paid for, a, a people's credit union, interest-free credit union, that you might be interested in following up. Get onto our, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, get onto our uh, email list, and if you're not already on it, I'll give you a card. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Virtual money. Let's welcome Mark. Thank you for having us here, Dennis. Uh, in reference to Deb, she talked about mortgages. Does anyone know what the definition uh, of a mortgage is? <laughs> Payment until death. <laughs> in fact, it's a penalty for having gone to an institution to ask for finance when there is actually a remedy. You don't need to get finance. I'll talk about that later, but mortgage is a penalty. You're paying a monthly penalty for having done something that is actually a sin because uh, anyone of faith, I'm not saying Christians, I'm just saying people of faith are not meant to be indebted to another. Now, we're all sinners. I've done it in the past. I don't have a debt now, though. About virtual money. We all know now that banks are really the major problem. Who likes having all their financial affairs uh, in the public, being exposed? No. Any hands? Obviously all of you like your privacy or yes. privacy. Well the founders, I shouldn't say found, well the founders of virtual money saw that as a need around the world uh, to have an alternative to a fraudulent system. They still use it, but they're, they're in a uh, transition and they use uh, certain banks as part of that transition, but they're looking for remedies too. And VM is a partial solution. It's a system of banking outside the banking system. Uh, the facility itself, the, the owner of the uh, company at this stage, he bought a company that was about to go under in 2000. They put a lot of millions into the technology of this product. They didn't have the product finished and yet they had no marketing arm because the product wasn't finished. So he purchased the company. He's an international uh, property developer. Realised he had personal problems in paying his staff all around the world. And so when he found the product, he decided that he would purchase the company and finish the product, which it was done in around 2003. Anyway, you can't see the card from here. It is a debit card, a proper debit card. You can't over uh, extend on it. Anyone had dishonour fees when they pulled a little bit much out of the ATM and you hit by 40 bucks? Can't be done. The last $10, it was designed, you could not pull out so that it would prevent you from going into dishonour. So it's a way of managing your money. But uh, the only information on this card is a, a number of zero uh, digits identifying the uh, bank itself, which is VM. They have a bank number, private company though, and there are, the last digits on the card identifies the card holder to VM. That's short for virtual money. So no one else knows uh, your banking um, information as such. You know, you have your own bank account, you can go on online, go into your account, it's very nice. And you can do transfers around the world on that card to another card in one second without the banking costs. There are no foreign exchange um, fees on the, on the transaction. It costs literally $2 to send money around the world. And if you send $1,000, the other side is going to have $1,000 put on the card. It's nice, isn't it? 
Uh, we have a fellow in, in uh, Perth who sends $2 million every month because he buys goods into Australia and he spends nearly $50,000 in bank fees. You know, a certain percentage on the actual amount that's transacted into Indian currency, as well as a telegraphic transfer here, as well as the intermediate bank that does the trans... It's an American bank, by the way, they control the globe. And then the recipient bank takes another little piece out. So there's three banks involved in fees, plus the uh, cross rate, if you like, the, the um, exchange rate percentage. So the, the maximum you can pay on here is $100. It's 0.1% up to 100000 if you're sending money. And it's done in real time. Uh, other than that, there's an account keeping fee, very minimal, $2.70 a month on this particular program. And if you're travelling, it's the ideal travel car because nobody else can use this. There's no signature on the back. If you look at the black strip, uh, this the only information on there is the card number. Um, so if somebody else gets the card, unless you've given them the PIN number and an access uh, code for internet transfers, then uh, they have no way of using it. It's a piece of useless plastic. But as a friend of ours uh, <coughs> travelling uh, had her card scanned while she's in Canada, and $10,000 was booked up on it. You know, you can buy little machines. They don't cost very much. You can probably get them at Dick Smith's. You're walking past and they scan your card. I know two years ago, 9 million Americans had their ID stolen and put onto plastic. And then away they go spending your money. So it can't be done with this card. But if you lose the card, you haven't lost the money either. Uh, I, I have two cards. Um, Karen has the other one right now. but. You know, if I, if I lose a card, I'll just activate the second one and I'll just do a, an online transfer from the old card, I don't need the card, and just transfer it immediately to the new one in one second, and off I go again. So it's a fabulous travel card as well. Uh, here there are two ways of loading it. We have... Um, it's, it, we can use a local, one particular local bank. Uh, interna uh, internationally, there are other banks aligned, not, not uh, just in some countries like Canada, America, uh, New Guinea of all places, coming on stream, um, New Zealand. Uh, you can do an online transfer for you, from your current account directly onto the card, or you can do a cash deposit, which uh, can be done anonymously. <coughs> Instead of your name, you can use the digits on the card as your reference number and that identifies the card holder to VM. So that is the basic concept of the card. It's for your own protection, for your own privacy. Of course, there'll be interests that won't like it around the world, but you know, even some of those interests are using it, so there's obviously a, a use for it. Um, on the other side of the equation, uh, it's, it's, there is an opportunity that goes with it. It's not a um, networking opportunity. Um, but it is maybe a thousand times faster for those that may be looking for um, what we call passive uh, income. Uh, and that's very, very exciting. So that's about all I've got to share. I can go into greater depth, but that gives you the concepts of an alternative system which is depriving energy from the most insidious group in the world, the banksters. And if you like that concept, just see me after. I have information here that I can give out uh, about the card itself, uh, we have applications for the card. The cards themselves are $30. We have some here available too. So at this stage, are there any questions? Yes, we've got, no, you can't. If you come up with the line, please, we need to get it recorded, you see. By the way, is there anybody that would not like to have such a card? Hands up. There you go, you've done a good job. 100%. Your question, please. Does that mean that I have to transfer all my money into your bank to use that card? Well, it depends on what, what you want to put away onto the card platform. The card itself is the bank. Um, yeah, you don't actually formally need a bank. You don't. The card, it's deposited. The, the account is linked worldwide within the virtual money system. They have software that runs the total global system independent of the banks. So whether you deposit New Zealand, Canada, anywhere, it goes into one account, but there are sub-accounts, and the card numbers identifies those sub-accounts, but the banks don't know. All they see is a 
chunk going in here, one branch of one bank, whichever country it's in, it's just pulling up. But those digits can be shifted anywhere in the world and you just pull it out from an ATM, any ATM. So it's like a private little bank box yes. in your name, with your yes, money it is. in it. With your amount, you can put in what you like. There is a, a limit to start with. You need one form of ID because they have their own in house security. They have ex FBI that run the department, so they don't want fraud within this system. They keep it squeaky clean. So there is a limit uh, on the amount you can put in to start with, but if you need a higher limit, you apply for it. Just send an email with further identification to our um, card increase, and they increase the card for you. But they do their checking first to make sure you're not one of those blacklisted in the country that you're a resident in. One more quick question. Sure. How safe is it from cyber fraud? No one has been able to penetrate it yet. And the team that watch the accounts actually see hackers and they redirect them to the FBI. So anyone that tries to hack in is visible. But to date, no one has ever been able to penetrate, and that's now five years, so it's a pretty good track record. You, you should ask that of your bank, whether <laughs> they had that track record. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, madam, your question. How do you keep track of your transactions? Just go online, you can see them straight Just away. online? Yeah, it's all there. It's an account. Will the taxation department want to know the ins and outs of your, your tracking? Oh, they probably would want to know, well, but are you going to tell them? Well, I mean, do you have to? <laughs> that, that depends on who you are, which I'm going to discuss a bit later. Like, you know, if you've got your income and you choose to put it into that account, mm -hmm. the no, taxation only, only office... you can put it into the account. I know that, but the taxation office still want to know where's your income? What have you spent it on? Well, what have you had? Well... I'm, I'm coming from a different point. I, I know have no you are. I know you are. Start, but the but powers that be, as a taxation officer, you, they you want have to know to, where you spend every dollar. Yeah, well, you, you have to feel comfortable where you're at. Because I can't tell you what you should and shouldn't do. It's not my right to do that. You know, if you want to declare something, well, you declare it. If you don't want to declare it, you know, it's the old saying, if, uh, if uh, you can't do it, you're right. And if you can do it, you're also right. It's up here. Mark, a question. Um, let's say everybody in the room put $100 in, where does that money go and what is done with it? Uh, well, I've got to clarify that a little bit more. If everybody that's in this room deposits the funds in, a, in the one country, yes. rather than they might have money, a lot of people have money overseas, you see, that's a different thing, but it's still linked the same, it's still the same account within the virtual money software. But for the purpose of saying that the people are in just one country and they deposit at that bank in the one country, it just goes into a trust account. So the bank sees it as just money that's flowed in to one account name, to um, you know the, the name of the account. Uh, what's done with it? Really nothing. The funds just sit there earning their annual rate of interest, whatever it is. Um, but those people who want transactions, for example, if you pull some money back out of the wall, then out of your personal account, money is withdrawn, and the bank will adjust the digits accordingly. But so does VM. It's an offset facility all around the world. They just shift digits from one account to another. Like if it's deposited in one country and someone sent oh, sorry, money to another country, all they're doing is shifting the digits from one card to another card because the software reads all that. Good. And they're building that. They want to build that for every country in the world, but that's going to take time and money. You mentioned three ways how they make their money. The $2 transaction per whatever, and also the $2 something account fee per month, or month, plus the money that they would get earned interest while the money sits in the bank. Is there any others? You're, talk you're talking about virtual money income. income. Right, yeah. yep, yep. They earn interest. They, the funds, they would naturally have their own way of um, making money on those funds while the funds sit in the account. All corporations do that. But the other way is uh, there is a load fee, uh, it's $2, there's a account keeping fee and there's also the ATM fee and that varies depending on the program you're on. It can vary from $1.50 to $5. Um, internationally it's $5, it's just the same as any other card, you know, MasterCard, Visa, you go offshore and you know, to pull out $1,000 as a $5 ATM fee. Here it's lower, of course.
But what you don't notice when you go overseas is that uh, on your statement the next month, you got a 3% uh, international transaction fee to get it from their currency into Aussie dollars. So you'll have a $30 fee on your account. We don't have that. VM is a much cheaper way of operating. Good. Yes, indeed, sir. Pardon my ignorance, but you deposit your money into VM as virtual money. But to take that to the whole of the world, you get back real money, which would come out of our banking system. Um, there has to be, under my thinking, banks in the normal banks that we have now involved in that situation. There is. Yeah, we, there, there needs to be a deposit taking bank involved. So you have two ways to load. Oh, there are more than that in other in some countries, but uh, some countries have two ways of loading their car. You can walk in with a cash deposit into the account, into that deposit taking bank, or you can do an online transfer, which all it does is shift digits from one bank yeah. to another one, because the card actually has a bank coordinate. Right, online banking, there's none of that stuff that you're putting in your wallet at the moment, you know, appearing. But if I wanted to withdraw cash on that card, the money that comes out of the hole in the wall is printed in Australia, isn't it? Um, and I'm just a little bit confused as to how we keep the banks out of the VM system. Well, the, the software that runs it is internal to the VM. They have access to the ATMs. By the way, the banks also have access to the ATMs, but they're not bank ATMs. It's a separate corporation called First Data that owns about 85% of them in this country, and another small company that owns the rest. That has nothing to do with the bank. Just as the, the money has nothing to do with the bank. There are companies in Melbourne, they produce 16 currencies for 16 countries, but not for Australia, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard years ago that Malaysia actually produces the Australian currency. Good. Yes, and one more question. Account limits. Is there a limit on how much you can draw out of the account? A thousand dollars a day. Okay. Yes, yep. And if you need more, you just do a transfer from your card account. Just go online into your card account and do an online transfer from your card to another bank account, then if you need so, 50, if, so if I need a lot, I could just go around to different banks, different ATMs and just pull it Yeah, but only a thousand a day. Okay, yeah. unless you sort of do it online or something. Yeah, you can do it online and do a, a big, bigger chunk straight into another account and then yeah, walk into the bank and say, uh, from yeah. an ATM, no, thousands the limit. And, and it's also limited by some machines. I've been to machines out bush and 300 is the limit some places 500 so it is actually limited a bit by the machine but you know you can go back in and get two lots of 500 for example but a thousand is, is the limit per day from the VM card unless you send it to another account. Mark thank you very much indeed. Coming up to give us a short talk on practical ideas, practical actions to take in these current financial times of crisis. Let's welcome Chris Coyle.